your name? Where are you from? My name is Nal. I'm from Switzerland. And I'm a scientist at DeepMind. And what are you going to talk to us today about? Today I'll talk about ways to generate the future. <laughs> Do you want me to try this again? <laughs> Today I'll talk about generative models and neural networks. Okay, brilliant. Now who's, who's best to work for, DeepMind or Facebook? Can't say. But obviously DeepMind, I mean I can't say. <laughs> oh, Nas, Nas joining us soon. So. <laughs> 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 I'm sure I should do that. You should, you should cut that. <laughs> What are you most passionate about um, regarding what, what, what sort of grabs you with artificial intelligence and machine learning? What grabs me is sort of trying to, under, I think understanding learning is the, is, it means understanding the most complex thing that we are faced with every day, um, and which is our brains or human brains learning from the environment. And so understanding this process is sort of a very inspiring kind of uh, question. A very important question. A lot of people would be very envious of your job, like DeepMind, you know, it's one of the most renowned machine learning places to work. What's your view on that? Is it as good? As, will, you, will you ever think you're working there? Is it as good as it's, it's an excellent place and it's very unique and people should apply. Everyone who would like to have a chance, they should try. Okay, so where do you see AI in five years' time, ten years' time? I think AI will, will affect the world significantly uh, and it's already happening, so it's going to happen even more and more. It's hard to predict beyond five years what is going to happen, and uh, it's really hard to say we need that many years for you know general intelligence and so on. But it's a very cool, it's a very important problem to work to work towards. And while we work towards it, we will learn new techniques that will have enormous impact on the world. And uh, and uh, you know for things like health, for things like um, um, all kinds of modeling, uh, climate, I don't know, any 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 of the important problems will be will be significantly um, improved with AI over the next years, as we walk toward the general kind of intelligence. Thank you. OK, hi, my name is Nal. <laughs> I work at DeepMind. So um, well, it's, um, it's great because Sumit gave you one perspective on uh, generative modeling uh, and one approach. And I'll be talking about, about a slightly different approach that we developed um, for images we developed recently over the past uh, maybe um, a year or so. But I, so I want to tell you about this approach, but I also want to tell you a slightly more um, sort of abstract idea where I want to show you that there is a simple, uh, a simple model that can actually model not just images, but also all kinds of different uh, data and dom in different domains. So um, when it comes to GRT models, uh, so why, why do we call them generative? Actually, I think there's a, there's a sort of gray line between you know, generative models and just you know, supervised models. And basically, when, when it comes to these kinds of models, we want to generate sort of complica complicated objects. So and these objects can be sort of sequences, like you know, the, the character, the handwriting of, um, of the human handwriting from, say, uh, text. Um, or, we, or we want to generate images, as we've, as we've just seen, or we want to generate uh, just, just natural language. And, and uh, well, on the one hand, we want to do this just for purposes of uh, content creation or, or just, you know, uh, or, or, or prediction of the future or, you know, what comes next and so on. Uh, but if we have a probabilistic generative model, we can do many other things. Uh, we, can, uh, we can have a sort of, uh, we can score the quality of these things. We can know if it's a good image or a bad image or if it's a good uh, natural sentence or a bad natural sentence. Um, and so our goal would be to actually build a probabilistic uh, generative model. And uh, what we'll find out actually that there's basically this one simple method to do this, which can generate all these things that you see right now. And these are all, um, let's say, state of the art uh, models for these kind of generations, where the state of the art is measured by the likelihood that the model actually attaches to data. So this will be the goal of, of this talk. So um, I'll, I'll jump right in. And I guess if there's. Um, one thing you can try to remember from, uh, from this talk is basically this, this idea. And uh, it's a very sort of simple way of approaching the, the generative modeling problem. And it's a very well-defined uh, way of approaching it. 
and uh, which allows us to have these tractable models which you can measure the likelihoods uh, precisely. So imagine that we have uh, two kinds of problems. We want to say um, measure the, so we want to just assign a probability to this, to this sentence, the cat set on the mat, standard sentence used in academia. Academics are never uh, that creative, you know, they always have uh, two simple things. Um, and, um, or, or, or to, to something like a dog. And so if we think about what sentences are, for instance, or what images are, these are they're basically these kind of high dimensional objects, right? A sentence made of, sort of six, six words, or if you cut down in characters, it's made of many different uh, characters. And, um, and if you were to describe it, basically, um, it would be some big vector where, you know, uh, with, with some kind of ordering or something like this, where, uh, um, where, where each point of this vector presents a word or something like that, right? So basically, it's a high dimensional object, it's made of small components. And, and the same for images. The images are sort of made from, let's say, from the pixels. Um, and actually, you have RGB channels in the pixels. So there's basically three channels per pixel in every image. And what is, what is interesting and kind of sort of, which is true of basically all data that we're interested in, is that we can, we can take a complicated object uh, that we want to model and sort of break it down into some, to some uh, more, more, more um, easily um, uh, achievable sort of uh, some, some parts which are smaller to model and can be, can be more easily modeled. So, and this is basically all there, all there is to this approach. And if we want to, if we want to assign this distribution, want to learn distribution for sentence or image directly, it would be basically impossible because if we're just counting different images and they'll be just all different, we, we couldn't do this, right? So what we want to do without making any assumptions is basically take this our object X and take this probability for the object and sort of break it down into its components. I will not show any other equations, but this is the one equation that you can try to um, um, <laughs> remember maybe. But basically, if X is the object we want to model, then we will um, take sort of the parts of X that we care about, such as uh, the words in a sentence or the pixels in an image, we'll turn the gener generative process into a sequential process where we, we, take, we take sort of each component and we predict it given everything, uh, be, uh, um, everything before it. And so we can take this, so uh, whereas before with GANS, assume it, show, uh, assume it showed you basically the way you generate an image, for instance, that like directly from the latent space, all pixels at the same time, what happens here, um, in the case of images, we generate one pixel at a time, uh, starting from a corner and come to the other corner, for instance, given ev everything we generated before. Um, and so, uh, and to sort of to, to, to mention the generality of this, and, and in a way the simplicity, but also generality of this, is, um, and wh when these models actually become useful is when we condition them on something else, on some kind of, on, on some other, um, on some other signal, why. And, um, and you know, we want, maybe we want to generate a sentence, but actually maybe we want to translate it from another sentence. Um, or maybe you don't want to just a, a general image, maybe you want an image of a dog or something like that. And uh, Sumit was already hinting at this before, and um, it's the same kind of problem. And basically, with, when we look at it in this way, we can see that all, many problems such as language modeling, uh, image modeling, even machine translation, uh, which is just a form of uh, language modeling, uh, can be sort of recast in this, in this framework. And so it allows us to sort of have a very simple, at least theoretically very simple sort of um, approach to it. Now, yes, we did this, right? We took a complicated object X and we broke it into parts. Um, and I'll give you a specific example soon. Um, but so, we, I mean, it kind of feels a bit magic because these are very complicated things and how do we actually model them, right? And so all the, all the difficult, uh, all, I mean, all the difficulty, let's say, comes into engineering um, the architecture, the neural architecture, and then sort of neural network that can predict all these uh, component parts correctly. Um, so I want, to, uh, I want to give you, uh, the rest of my talk will just be uh, sort of exemplifying with various examples uh, what I just told you to make it a bit clearer. And I'll talk about the language case for sentences and the image case for images. Um, and um, um, yeah, so, and, and what, I, what, I, what I would like you to sort of maybe take from this is sort of the analogy, the many analogies that we have when we model for, uh, something like language or model images in, in, this, in, this, uh, in, this, in this framework. And there's nothing particularly philosophical, it's just a very convenient thing to do, right? And we have, um, and these models, uh, which, which will be probabilistic, will be very stable. And so we have this kind of neural network which is very stable, can be very easily trained. 
and also we can very easily uh, evaluate the, how well it is doing compared on, on some test data because we actually have the probabilities. So, um, yeah, so these models are basically are attractable. We can actually get a sentence and get a number for it, which is the probability the model assigns to this sentence. Um, so, I hope many of you are um, familiar with neural networks, otherwise it would be a bit hard to follow from now on. <laughs> but, uh, but this is fairly standard. And um, um, basically, uh, so, uh, but I guess I, I, want to, well, I want to illustrate the, the generative process. Um, uh, but in the case of language, it's fairly standard. It's been known for about um, at least uh, 15 years or 13 years or 15 years or so. And what is interesting, once the language modeling problem has been defined in this, in this sort of uh, chain rule factorization framework that I just spoke about, hasn't actually changed. Current CLDR models are exactly in the, in the same framework. So there's something very stable about it. Um, but what's interesting is that as, we, as we've been improving the neural architectures and the way we understand networks and the way all the tricks and all these things, then also the, the results have been much, much better. And um, although the first time this kind of approach has been proposed for uh, language modeling uh, or language generation, uh, it didn't use a recurrent network and didn't use a, a so-called long short-term memory network, um, which is just a network which has, sort of propagates signals very well along, uh, across many um, long-term um, dependencies. Um, when, even though it wasn't proposed like this, when you actually take a network like this and you plug it in, uh, you can see you get actually better results. And so the way basically it works is that um, we have here on the, on the lower side sort of the input set, it's the input, and outside, and, um, and uh, the, the, the sequential process, the way it works, is you take the sort of beginning of sentence token, and you sort of predict a distribution of the first words, and then you give back to the network the word that you've chosen, or the word that is true, and you predict a distribution of the second word, and so on. And these small distributions, when, they, when, they're, when you put them together, take the product of them, they create, they create the value of the probability of the sentence and model attaches to it. Uh, I have to say a word about architectures because, um, as I was telling you, it's the, the framework is simple, but then um, sort of capturing um, uh, the, the, the problem in the, in the right architectural way becomes, becomes really the issue. Uh, and so a recurrent network, in the case of language, is one, one, one way of modeling it. Um, and um, a convolutional network, so basically, there's, 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 since we have a sequential problem, there's basically two kind of architectures they want to use. And one is the recurrent one, and the other one is the convolutional one. And we can sort of uh, think about them and, what, and, and how they model things differently. And in the case of the recurrent network, as we just saw, because it has this sort of state in it, we can model lo very long, long range dependencies and there's no, um, there's no history break. So we can see everything we generated so far up to that point. Uh, for instance, um, you know, on depends on everything that we have seen before. Um, whereas in the case of convolutional network, um, it's a different kind of architecture which only sees, say, a finite amount of the past. So when we predict these factors, which make up the probability distribution for the whole sentence, um, we want to be sort of want to think about the kind of architecture that we use and how much context matters, how much, how, how many words or how many things do we have to see in the past, um, and, and so on. But if we do this, nice things happen. Um, so um, here are just some samples from a, from, from a, a, a recent, so um, it, it's a very well-defined kind of procedure. Um, and uh, you can then sort of, you have this, you can imagine, you know, having these deep networks or, or whatever, and, um, and then you train them, you train them for a long time, and they train very well, and your error goes down. You have to be careful to not overfit, but you can measure it correctly. Um, and, um, uh, and recently, for instance, in 2016, so I mean, just, there's just this year, uh, there's been another paper with some very great results and uh, by um, Rafael Yosevovich and some of my other colleagues. Um, and, um, and, then, and, then, and then you learn this model and then you sort of try to get some samples out of it, right, and see what it has learned and learn some nice sentences like this one. By the way, this is a bit boring because it's all about like news and uh, I don't know, but yeah, politics. Uh, um, so also makes kind of strange, sometimes, sometimes makes some strange errors. Uh, the muscles warm and, and so on, but um, we should still be a bit impressed, I suppose. Uh, but, but by the way, this is sort of the, the current state of things, but you know, it's, it's not bad. Um, it, 
it, when you model on, on words, it doesn't learn to do arithmetic, actually. Um, still, you know, in 30 years, between 61 and 63, and it's more like two years. Um, but, um, yeah, but, you know, so, not, uh, so in the way this is implemented here, of course, each word is its own uh, different thing, and so, yeah, it, it doesn't learn to count. But the networks can, can learn to count in different situations. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, this is another one, a sentence which actually kind of feels fine. It looks, uh, looks perfectly OK. <laughs> <laughs> and um, OK, this is just um, a bit more sort of syntactic errors. And, uh, but uh, yeah, so. Uh, just to give an idea, basically it's a, it's a very long-term prediction problem, right? So you start, you, you learn, you train this model, and then you sample the first word, and then you put it back into the model, and you're generating one, one step at a time, and the errors to some extent accumulate. So um, um, because the longer you, the longer you go, there's more um, basically there's more entropy, but basically it becomes harder and harder to predict in the future. So the fact that we can do this for let's say about 100 words or maybe 50 words as you know, so on, in a, in a uh, in, a, in a decent way, it's also, it's also quite interesting, yeah. Now, this was introduction language modeling. This is uh, fairly old ideas, but they keep on improving within this framework. And uh, so I want to tell you um, about sort of, uh, I think there's been a, this has been known for 10 years, but it was always, it was always, always like, okay, it works for language, it works for some sequences, and then, you know, how do we, what, what do we do with it, right? I mean, we like it, it, it works really well. It has, it has been used in um, all kinds of applications, in speech recognition and, and, uh, and machine translation and so on. And, uh, but then sort of the question is, so how, how well does it work for other problems? And, um, 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 and so when you take an image, then you have a two-dimensional kind of input as opposed to, as opposed to one-dimensional input. And uh, so now instead of uh, each word in this, mo in this object they want to model, we're going to have um, sort of different pixels. And not just pixels, it's pixels come in sort of three different sets of values, the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. So we actually have sort of triplets of values for each, each pixel in this position. And if previously we were modeling each word given all the words that were coming before it, now we will model each pixel given sort of everything we generate uh, left and, to, and the top of it. So we want to model this uh, value xi. We will try to um, try to predict it, of course, given everything else we've learned, and also based on uh, everything we've seen uh, up to that point. So um, I will just show an example to get to, 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 to make it uh, a bit more clear. And just as before, where we were uh, predicting distribution for each word in the sequence, now we predict a distribution for each, each, each pixel. And actually this issue has been sort of uh, a long-standing one. How, you know, what is a good distribution for pixels? You know, they're, they're continuous. What is, a good, what is a good way of, um, of um, parameterizing the, the distribution or what is the shape of it? And uh, one trick that we sort of describe in this paper, which is again, uh, helps in the stability of these models and um, makes it also again, very similar to language model, is just to use a multinomial sort of softmax distribution. Okay, so uh, let me just sort of um, give you an example of how this works to give you some more intuition. Basically, we start from the left corner on top and we, the we just choose the first uh, pixel from the, the distribution. And then given this, given this pixel, we choose the next one, right? And we keep on going this way. Um, and um, this is a real sample that I'm showing you. So, it's, so just like the sentences before, which are sampled from a real model, this is also a sample from a real model trained on uh, ImageNet, uh, which is a, just a very sort of various kind of uh, set of uh, images. Uh, and so you see how so it gets the, gets the black border and it sort of it's uh, so it chooses to start predicting the black border and it's consistent. And I think many images in this data set come with this black border, so um, it's just one way of sort of you know respecting distribution. Uh, but way, another subtle point is which kind of differentiates this method from GANs is a little bit, although uh, it's, it's a bit technical. It's basically, you have a distribution of these objects, and in principle, you want to capture the whole distribution with the versus, the multiple, multiple modes, uh, and so in all, all its complexity. And um, 
um, in these models they're kind of known they kind of known to do that and that's that's a good thing because because it's so simple and, so fu and it's fully visible and we can exactly measure the probability of these things and how well they're doing we know we're not throwing anything away when you have complicated systems sometimes um, you might be missing missing out on these details so it's good that we can do this here um, okay so well we keep on generating for, for this sample uh, and I've been showing the distribution before, but at every step we have a distribution, and now we can actually see how this looks. Now we generate sort of half of a bird, and um, and now we can sort of have a um, uh, and basically uh, the model, for instance, now is predicting um, this kind of distribution over the middle values for the next pixel. So as expected, it's sort of saying, okay, the next pixel should have sort of like you know sort of middle mid middle intensity kind of kind of thing, right? Yeah, so it's green, it's not too dark, not too white. Um, here's an interesting prediction because um, it's saying the pixel is either really, really kind of dark, the next one, or it's somewhere in between. And um, what's sort of significant about this is that this, is, this distribution is very sort of non-smooth, right? You see, you see this very high peak on this, on the left side, uh, which is for the zero intensity value. And, uh, and it's the, the kind of shape of the distribution that we use can handle this kind of material, or this kind of, uh, can learn these kinds of things. So you can also see how complicated the, the objects that we're trying to model are, right? Because they're sort of, um, the world is complicated. When we generate images, we try to generate, you know, uh, the world and the, the data uh, that we've just seen. So, um, so the model really needs to, you know, sort of try to extrapolate from all these things what, um, what, 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 what would come next. Right. And sometimes it's very divergent and, and sort of non-smooth. They will have things like the crazy things like this, and now it's sort of unsure what to do next, I guess. Um, yeah. Um, and um, and so we keep on uh, keep on producing, and you see a nice uh, peacock. Um, I guess I think it's a peacock. Um, and um, it's generated this way. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so I, I hope you, just like for the language where you sort of see that one word comes after the other and, well, in the language is more natural, um, in this case, you, I hope, you, sort of you can see how this uh, two-dimensional object can be generated one step at a time, too. And what is remarkable, as in, like in the language case where we're generating, um, you know, 50 words and there were, it, was, it was making some mistakes, but it was doing a good job. Um, here we have to generate, let's say, uh, 32 times 32 pixels, so let's say 900 of them, and actually there's three uh, predictions per pixel. So the kind of long-range dependencies the model needs to learn are uh, even, even more complicated, even, even harder to, to, to do. But the amazing thing about this is now, now we actually, for any image, we can perfectly sort of assign a number to it, uh, a, a score between 0 and 1, a probability score. And it's um, and our model is sort of um, you know well normalized, well defined, and sort of if you were summing across all the possible images, you get you get exactly one. Um, and this can be very useful if you um, if you um, if, if you're in a setting where you need to know what is a plausible scenario, what is not a plausible scenario, you want to have these kind of measures. Okay, now I will spend a few words about about architecture. I showed you earlier. Um, I showed you earlier the sort of LSTM methods and the convolutional methods for language. It turns out there is something like this also for for images, uh, except everything is two-dimensional now because um, we want to sort of respect the, the two spatial dimension of our data. And where, uh, yeah, whereas in the language was a unidimensional problem. And so just the way you have unidimensional uh, recurrent networks and unidimensional convolutional networks. Uh, you can have two-dimensional recurrent networks and two-dimensional, well, standard convolutional networks, which are actually two-dimensional always. And as I was saying before, when we predict the value of each pixel, we can only see stuff that is left and up to it. And with this operation, which is called a mass convolution, basically, uh, when we stack many, la many layers of this, uh, these mass convolutions, we, uh, we start seeing more and more of the receptive field that we care about. Um, and we can keep on doing this, and we see the receptive field along, uh, around the pixel that we, that we want to model uh, grows bigger and bigger, and which, is, which is nice. Uh, but we also see there's, like a, there's always like a, like, a, like a gap on the right side, 
um, in particular here, and this is basically because of the construction of the operation. Um, and, um, and also, we do not see if the image is sort of um, very large, we're always going to have some borders to the left and to the top. Nonetheless, um, predicting pixels, just like predicting a language, for the most part is a local problem. So if you see enough of what you, of what you need, uh, you, can, you can make a really good prediction. And, um, um, and so, so actually even these pixel CNNs, pixel convolutional networks, actually work really, can work really well. But there's also a fix, a such a different way of sort of uh, um, uh, um, uh, modeling the same problem. And here, um, just the way we use LSTMs for language, you can use two-dimensional LST LSTMs uh, for, uh, for, um, for, uh, for these images. And in this work, we actually propose some efficient implementations of these LSTMs uh, or some side variations on, on some things uh, that, that help us to do this. And so what happens if before, we, we, when, we're, when we're trying to model this pixel, we couldn't see everything. Here, because it's recurrent, because it sort of comes from all the, from all the directions and um, it uh, sort of puts together all the information, from the very first layer can cover the entire field. But for performance reasons, we actually want to increase the number of layers that we have. And um, so basically, you can think of the network sort of going through the input that has already produced multiple times and thinking about it, what's going on, you know, what comes next. Is the peacock or is it a different kind of bird? I don't know. Um, and um, and to, to, in order to make this prediction, and so uh, you know, you want a model that has sort of uh, many layers of this kind of uh, bidirectional networks. So uh, yeah, so and so when you do this, you actually get pretty large models. Um, there's been some questions about the size of these models uh, of, of uh, to, to zoom it, and in our case, these models are actually quite big, uh, in the 50 or Hundred million parameters. Um, oh, oops, that's a missing slide. Uh, but so uh, we can we can get some uh, results. Uh, we can we can basically when we train these models, we can get the likelihood of these models for various types of data sets. And um, 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 and so one standard data set is CIFAR10. It's kind of a small data set. But um, if you just have a say a uniform distribution, we don't know what you're doing. You have about eight. Uh, bits per channel. So if you just predict channels randomly, and for a long time, we uh, many models were reducing this value a lot, and 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 you know, and there were different kinds of models and variational um, autoencoder and uh, deep GMMs and all, all these models, and there they improvements. But every improvement gets much much harder because you're basically um, you have to be more and more precise. And when we train this model, what we found out actually that we have a big jump. Uh, in this sort of this vanilla approach, we actually have a big jump in this in this uh, in this performance. Um, and um, to give a sense of what these numbers mean, actually, is that if for each each pixel that you want to uh, you want to or each channel that you want to um, remember, um, if you don't know if you know nothing about the world, you have to store eight bits per each pixel per, per each channel. Whereas if it, whereas if you actually have this model which has learned all kinds of things about the world, you only have to store three bits. Per, per channel. So it means that, that the, the previous five bits, basically, the model has sort of learned everything. So it's completely certain that it cannot be all the other stuff. And it can only be, but it's still a bit uncertain about, about, about what it could be. And so uh, it has a sort of this value of three bits. Now, one hope is that because just, just the way sort of language models have been, uh, in the case of language, have been sort of improving all the time at a really, really fast rate, the numbers we see now, although they're really um, they're quite impressive. Um, Actually, hopefully, they, 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 they probably will just be getting better as we improve the architectures and so on. And potentially, the framework will not change that much. So yeah, uh, and there's um, I don't have tables because they're a bit yeah I have more samples. But yeah, so this is true for it. The model is still the art on basically every normal benchmark by a very large margin. Um, and uh, yeah, so here are some samples uh, again. And um, so these are 64 and 64, I believe. Um, and uh, so, the, the, what uh, maybe the, the most important thing to appreciate here, if you want to compare with um, what you remember from uh, Sumit's talk uh, from the GANs, is that um, basically there's a very well, there's a lot of diversity base, and the model really sort of co I think it's pretty clear it's sort of capturing most of the distribution uh, of the real distribution of the images potentially, and um, so it creates you know cats and sceneries, um, and um, 
for a sequential model like this, it's, it's quite uh, it's, it's very impressive. Um, and also, there's a, there's a, there's a, you cannot see the originals, but they're extremely sharp. And this is maybe not so um, surprising, but it's because of this sort of autoregressive and because of this sort of step-by-step -step prediction that it can be, can be completely sharp about what it's doing. Um, some more samples, and again, the diversity is what you can appreciate. You cannot always see an object in them, some, most of the time you can, and it's very coherent and so on. But, um, and also, these images are basically, uh, if you, yeah, yeah, I guess if you, yeah. So if you're exposed to the world and try to sort of learn from all of it, maybe you create something like this. Although I think we can, we can do better as humans. Um, oh yeah, so you can also take half of a real image and see how it completes it. And um, um, again, it's, it's, uh, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like the painting example that we saw earlier, but you can sort of see half an image and you want to one final completion. Because the model is probabilistic, you can sort of sample as many completions as you want, you just keep to completing different things. And so uh, we see that so in the first row, it sees sort of half a ko koala bear on, on a tree. And uh, <laughs> in most cases, you know, actually, um, you know, it can understands that it's a tree and continues the branch and, um, and sort of continues, continues the koala and gives some kind of plausible ending to it. Um, <laughs> and then um, in the second case, it's quite remarkable. I mean, it, this is a round pattern and you sort of need to sort of complete this. But I mean, like, if you give me half of this image, I don't know what, I, what I'm going to draw, but it might not be a round circle, maybe something else, I don't know. But basically, it just likes to sort of try to finish this circle. Um, it, does, it does make some, you know, some implausible finishes, but it, it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, and the same for the dogs. So on, the, on, the, on all these image nets, you, you're gonna, on, the, on image net um, models, um, there's a lot of examples of dogs, because basically a third of the data set is dogs. Um, and there's a thousand different objects, but they're basically almost all dogs. I could be called Dognet. Uh, it would be fine. Um, but so there's also dogs, and in, in, but but the, all the different breeds, you know, and so it's it's very hard to to classify or, or to understand. But um, and so there's some good examples here, and these are not particularly handpicked, as I've shown you before. Um, so it's very diverse. Of course, there will be some things which look uh, less plausible, and some things that look more, um, just just as good. Um, but um, but the model doesn't doesn't overfit on anything. It sort of it kind of really nicely in a very natural way captures what is supposed to be captured. Um, well, you can you can do a lot of different things with this with this stuff, and we we just started exploring about uh, six months ago, and we have a more recent paper out. Um, and uh, so you can also, con as I was telling you earlier, you can condition on a model on some kind of labels. Um, and uh, maybe it's a bit hard to read, but uh, if you do this, you get even more plausible things. Uh, actually, really remarkable. I mean, um, I can't believe it myself. So I'm going to look at them sometimes, but bec because of the complexity of the, of, the, of the issue. But you, you can see sort of elephant samples at the top and then coral reef and, uh, and, and other things. And we, can, and, and we can measure overfitting, so we can know if we're memorizing or not. Um, and uh, we can look at the numbers and, uh, and we're not. So, yeah. So anyway, so this is, this is it. Um, this is what I want, to, I want to tell you. So I just, um, basically to conclude, uh, we have, there's this very simple framework that, requ that requires, on the other hand, it requires relatively complex um, neural architectures but which applies to a diverse set of different things from language um, and to images. And I think we're going to be seeing more things in the future. Um, and uh, well, yeah, let's hope it works better as well as possible. Thanks. <laughs>
So we didn't we didn't try it, um, but yeah, you can do this. It doesn't. Uh, of course, you can as long as you see everything you generated. That's sort of the most important thing, and then the model will sort of learn to sort of adapt to different kind of configurations. But yeah, that will be that will be it might improve things. Yeah. Yes. Does the directionality built into your model actually affect the outputs in any way? You have this sort of left to right, top to bottom thing. Is there any way that you can see that in the generation? Well, can you see it? No. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> no, I mean, so also if you compute, if you, if you, if you change all four, the four directions, not the diagonal ones, which we haven't tried, but the, the normal ones, the, the values are almost always the same. The, the, the likelihood of the model is always the same, so and the samples are the same, so it, 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 it turns out not to matter. To this. Uh, had you looked at the higher order properties of the uh, distribution that was generated, like try to take the images that the uh, mixer and then generates, put them through like a VGG and kind of see a see a neural algorithm, you know, like look at the gram matrix of the activation map, that kind of stuff. Can you generate some textures? Does it look realistic on the higher orders? Um, so we have not done that. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, so I think what we've done actually is a small um, classification experiment where we um, try to uh, see how well a normal, uh, if, you, if you train a hardcore comnet on this and try to sort of distinguish between real and non-real samples, which is a, a bit like GAN, um, then, um, uh, you know, ca ca can it sometimes be fooled? And it, 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 can, some, it can be fooled quite a remarkable amount of times, but at the same time, um, as even just a slight bias. So here's the thing also that, that, that makes things like GANs a bit tricky sometimes, that even a slight bias of the model will make, the dis uh, will make it very easy for a discriminator or for a uh, classifier to, to understand if it's a sample or not. It could be just, just a very slight bias. So um, if a model can, can, can try to avoid these biases, it, it's a very good model. But yeah, so here it's, yeah, it's still sort of a work in progress. Yeah. Um, um, with regards to the sampling of mm -hmm. images, uh, I presume you, you have a uh, multi-node distribution for the next pixel and you sample from that and then you feed that for the next um, pixel that you want to predict. Uh, why not to basically propagate all the property, all, all the probabilities towards the next one rather than sampling from it? And sim similar to um, you know, the Kirby algorithm and dynamic programming that you could basically keep all the probabilities of the sequential uh, predictions. Right. And uh, basically sample, once you have all the property chains, you can sample the best uh, uh, prediction that fits the, uh, that maximizes the likelihood. So if I, understand, if I understand your question correctly, you're basically suggesting to do some kind of um, approximation for, for each, for each point, well, to, to do a, be a better search of what is more likely. So um, because you have unlimited long range dependencies here, what you can do is, uh, is some kind of beam search. But basically, you can, you, can, uh, you can basically try to find the most likely picture under the model. If you look, um, if you sort of remember, you know, the more likely ones and you actually search for the more likely ones. Um, and, and you can do that and that'll be perfectly fine. It might actually be, um, we haven't tried that. But that's how, you, if you want to find the most likely, if you want to approximately find the most likely image under the model, you would do something like this. You do like, you find, you know, you have a hundred hypotheses and then you try to keep the more likely ones per step. Um, but if you were looking at just the samples, uh, if we just uh, oh, and if you if you actually want to predict the next frame or something like this, or in a video, or something, this would be a very good idea to do, like to actually search for some more greedy for the maximal image. Uh, but if we want to look at what the probability distribution that model has learned, uh, something sort of uniformly as we do here, just I'm uh, not uniformly, but according to the just sampling, right? Not according to the distribution, um, it uh, sort of gives you the mo most diversity to what comes out. So the rest in, in generic images comes through the randomness and sampling. Yeah, exactly. So from the very first, you see distribution like this in the very first pixel, and then you just choose one, and then you keep on choosing. And the, the more you choose, the different things come, come out. Yeah. If you were to always choose the max, you would always have the same image. Yeah. Yes? Uh, when you're doing this conditioning up here, um, is that at each step of the draw, at, both in training and at regeneration, or is it only from like an early part of the sample? So uh, yeah, so then 
no, this, no, this is uh, so the, basically the, I didn't I didn't uh, explain this but you well. But basically, the way it works here is that you take the class the, the the class. So it says elephant, right? And then you feed this into each position of the of the thing. And so it doesn't know what comes before, but you actually just know it's an elephant. And then it's supposed to generate this. Um, so the conditioning is is a word based condition, or a language based condition. It's not a, not an image. Yeah. Yes. How does the how does the model scale to generating larger images? Because obviously, long short term memory is great for for kind of medium to long term predictions. But that you could generate arbitrarily large images, but surely at some point, kind of it, it breaks. You know, what what point did it break for you? That's a good question. So the question is, how do we generate much bigger images, um, and do we have more more long range uh, dependency problems and coherence problems? And I think. Um, and one, one approach we, we described actually is, is sort of multi-scale approach, where you first generate a small image, a sub, uh, sub-sampled you know, sub -sampled image, um, and you generate pixels. So basically you generate one every four pixels, or one every, say, eight pixels. And then, and then you have another model which sort of starts filling them in, and then you can, um, and you sort of, you, you, you fill in the, the pixels you, you missed, um, and, uh, and you can do this for a, a multiple times in a sort of, Kind of recursive, uh, multi-scale way, and what what we see with this model, uh, with, with this kind of uh, model, the multi-scale version, actually that the samples are high quality. There's more coherence across it, and so it's um, it's actually um, it makes it um, it's, it's a good thing to do. I think for very large images, we'll have to do something like that. Um, but yeah, but it can be done. I think it will be done. Yes. So. Yeah. Do you have any real use for these models? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so compression. Can you compress with gas? Anyway. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you a lot of models will be like this for sure. Yeah. So compression and content generation. Yeah, this is a perfect approach for multi resolution. Yeah, so um, the question is can you, sharp, can you sharpen images with this model um, or, or uh, upscale images? And if you have downscale, if you have some data set that can do this, uh, or if you build a data set that is like this, then you can train it basically out of the box at the multi scale version and you can sort of fill in the gaps uh, of pixels. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so yeah, so it's, yeah. Yeah, so if you train an upscaling model with this, which is basically one of the multi-scale uh, models, um, you, the model will actually see everything. So it has to go left to right, but all the generated pixels, or the blurry pixels, will be there, right? So you, you can see all of them because you have uh, this upscaling map. Um, but, and then you can just fill in the things you don't know, right? But you, you, you actually, in that case, you see the future context, and that's why you can um, you can sort of um, sometimes there's more coherence across the, a bigger image. Okay, thanks again to Anal, thanks again to Thank Sumit, you. thanks to AHL and Slevy, uh, thanks for you guys for coming on.